students who um, had, had outstanding experiences. And so today we'll not only learn about the experiences that students could have, but also um, learn about scientific research in conservation biology and ecology around the world. So. Before I start on, on, on telling you some stories about the sort of research that we do, let me just explain the first of our is an unusual sort of organization. We're effectively a network of over 200 academics now around the world, mainly in uh, Europe and uh, North America. We design and implement private research in a range of countries across the world. So we don't call these 25 research sites in our now the reason the academics get involved, and they're, and they're only involved over their summer holidays, so that's why they're actually running these expeditions, is, is so that they can get papers published. And if they're not publishing, then their own universities are not happy with them, and obviously we're not happy with them. So if you go out and do something like this, you're joining science which is being published. And it's, the way it's funded is by using tuition fees, and those tuition fees uh, are paid by undergraduates or by high school uh, teachers and uh, it provides a, a very neat way of being able to get long-term data sets because you imagine you're ecologists now and you, and you want to establish a long-term ecological data set which are the most valuable ones really in the literature how do you do it? well the way you normally do it is by trying for a grant and you go for a grant and you better get four or five years maximum and then you have to apply again and if you didn't get it that's it, that's the end of your project Whereas funding it this way, as long as we have students coming every year, and we have them coming in increasing numbers every year, it means that we can carry on doing the same surveys, the same methods at those sites and establish a really valuable one of data. And so far at some of the sites, we've got over 10 years worth of data already and we're continuing on with that. Now because the program is so big, we have 2,000 students in the field spread across these different sites over the summer holidays, as long as we are using the same techniques and the same types of habitats, then we can do some very interesting spatial comparisons. Well, so, for example, we have survey work going on in the, in the Indo Pacific, we have it in the Indian Ocean, and we have it obviously in many sites in the Caribbean. But we don't do this just to get um, academics' papers or new guys a good time in the field. The purpose behind it is to collect data in a form that can then be used for conservation management interventions. So the first thing we have to do at any site is to decide whether we've got a biologically important site. In order to do that, we bring in taxonomic experts in different groups, and we get them working there for two or three seasons. And at the end of that, we decide, have we got species due to science? Have we got uh, range extensions? Have we got decent populations of threatened species? And if we have, we move on to stage two. And stage two is where we then set up these massive monitoring programs right across the, uh, the study site. And for that, we need large numbers of people who complete the same survey, same method, year on year. So we look at how the communities are changing, what population levels are declining. The third stage is when we get the economists involved. So I notice we have some business people here. Uh, business is crucial to successful conservation management, in my view. The only way you're going to get people to preserve an area is to make sure they have a financial benefit in doing so. And so having the economists involved is, is a crucial stage. And then we wrap all that information up. That usually takes seven or eight summers to get to that stage. We wrap it all up. We go to somewhere like the World Bank in Washington or the Global Environment Facility or Darwin Initiative, and we ask for funding to, to set those sites up as best practice examples of conservation management. Well, if you knock on the door of the World Bank in Washington, they're not super friendly, to be honest, but if you manage to get in there, the first question they're going to say is, can you prove you've got a biologically informed site? Well, that's what we did in stage one. The next question is a tough one, though. They'll say, okay, it's important, but so are lots and lots of places. Can you demonstrate to us what the rates of loss are um, for this particular site? Well, most people can't do that. They can say what the threats are. We can actually quantify the losses in terms of how those communities are changing the population levels declining. And then the final thing they say is, okay, well, we're interested in biodiversity, but to be honest, we're not that interested. We're much more interested in poverty alleviation. So if we give you a million dollars, for example, then how can we be sure that that money is actually going to be spent on the forest floor, for example, or on the reefs? And that's why we have the economists involved. That means that by the time we get to this, to this stage, we can go straight to getting funding to set up uh, proper conservation management interventions. Now that money goes to the Operation Policy of Trust, which is a charity that has come to us, chaired by the Greater Good in Conservation Politics and Business in the UK, and they all give their time for free. So all the money that's raised goes directly into the field. So far, over $2 million, and a 
as you've seen a few moments, we can talk about the red scheme. A lot more uh, money will be so it's heading our way as well uh, to set up proper conservation uh, interventions at the site in which we've been gathering data. So you help them with science projects and you help them with long-term valuable ecological data sets, but you're also helping with gathering data in a form that can then be used for conservation management interventions. So lots of sites around the world. I'm not going to bore you by going through all the sites, telling you what we do in each of those sites. What I want to do is just pick out some of the highlights and some of the research questions that we need to ask. When you get out there, you are part of much, much bigger teams. The principal researchers are the 200 plus academics. We co-fund 14 PhD students. Now, all the PhD students we co-fund are people like yourselves who come out with us as undergraduates, then go on to do a master's, and if we're impressed with them in the field, uh, we may then offer uh, a way of co-funding a PhD to work in the field with us. Visiting academics, we have a lot of those uh, now coming out to see if they can join the program. Two groups of uh, university students, those gathering data for their own independent research project, uh, and you really need probably to be the junior year to do that here, uh, or those just coming to join it for experience, just to strengthen their resume, find out whether they want to carry on doing this sort of work. In other words, is it worth trying to be a full-time ecologist? I'm going to go and do a master's in it. Let's try it first in the field. We have lots of medical staff. At every site, we have doctors. Uh, and the reason we have that is just because of safety issues, uh, but it means that we have a lot of spare manpower in terms of medical uh, facilities. So we got them to write uh, an expedition medicine course. So if any of you are heading for well, medical school afterwards there is a special pre-med expedition medicine course that you can do uh, while still being up in the forest and out on the beach helping with biological survey. But we have a lot of operational staff members and there's basically um, one operational staff member for every two of you. So you're there, not, you're not there to put up a tent, make camps and cook and clean, that's all done for you. You're there to go and help the scientists with their research. So, that's how you can join as a research assistant. You can, uh, that's why you join, sorry. Then you have the fixed itinerary projects. These are the ones that are already fairly full. Uh, so we've had to sort of package it. So instead of giving you free options for which weeks you can join, we've had to say, well, we've only got these weeks left. You can do this project for four weeks or two weeks or whatever. And then there are much, much bigger programs where we have so many scientists, you can choose lots of different options. So let's start with some of the the fixed one. This is Madagascar. Um, when you go to Madagascar, um, you'll probably not recognize hardly anything because this is one of the most endemic rich sites in the world. Um, and of course, got lemurs, that's uh, one of the Sibaka spe species, uh, and that's not bobbed up, that's exactly how they travel. So when they come down from the trees, they sort of jump sideways and they tend to jump in long lines. It looks like a sort of disco dancing. Um, sort of lemurs, and then they'll go back up the trees on the other side of the road or whatever. Uh, and we have a whole series of uh, studies on these. The reason we're working down here is we're down in the spiny forest in the southeast corner of Madagascar. Has anyone been to Madagascar? Okay, well, if you, if you do go to Madagascar, the one thing you'll notice about it is probably the most disorganized country that I've ever been in. And I've spent a lot, long time in Indonesia, so my standards are really low anyway. But when I got to Madagascar, they dropped even further. These guys are phenomenal. You have to fly Air Madagascar. And they, they have a nice couple of tricks up their sleeve. They're quite often late. That's not that unusual in developing countries. The new trick is, they turn up early. I don't turn up for seven hours early. If you're, if you're there, fine. You get on the plane. If you're not, tough. You buy another ticket. And so in, in Madagascar, we have a person whose sole job is to check when the flights are actually going to arrive. Your field site is seven hours away, so we need a lot of notice to know in order to get you to the airport on time. If you're going to be working down there, you're working on a big WWF project. Uh, and what they're trying to do is to set up the whole of the Mandrari River Valley, and there are 18 reserves in it already. The whole area has a, has a biosphere reserve. And that attracts then additional funding, which will then help local communities to preserve their own wildlife. And we've got one of the big reserves flat back in the middle of that area to complete the biodiversity surveys on. So you'll start with the Madagascar Wildlife Course, which is two lectures, two, two practicals each day, and then you move off uh, to, to different remote camps and you'll be helping with the survey work as listed on there. Remember, this is the, the site for um, chameleons. 
and 50% of the world's chameleons live here in Madagascar. This is the Centre for Radiation. It's a fantastic project, but I'm interested in doing that. And the research projects on colour uh, adaptations of chameleons. So this is now an Egyptian site. This is a completely different type of project. This is what we would call an atlas project, which is where you cover an area with an imaginary grid of, say, 10 kilometer squares, and then you send survey teams into each of those squares, and you do standard survey effort. The end result of it is a set of maps showing, say, the distribution of higher plant species or the distribution of reptile species. And we're working in the Southern Sinai Mountains in Egypt here, um, and this is one of the most important, probably the most important area biologically in Egypt. Because the climate of Egypt has changed a lot over, over the last few millennia. It's begun to dry out, and a lot of the species that used to occur there are sort of pulled back to the Iran Mediterranean biogeographical zone. And they've been, they've been sort of uh, gone from Egypt, except in the Sinai, because in many cases they simply go up the mountains and manage to survive in those areas. And so you've got small, isolated populations of species that are extinct elsewhere across the whole of the. Um, Egypt. And so we start you off by taking you to a camp in, uh, in, the, in a small village called St. Catherine's, which is at the foot of the monastery uh, near Mount Sinai. Uh, um, we'll, we'll introduce you to a guy called Farag Fox, who when you meet him looks like a pirate, but he is the best Bedouin guide I've ever worked with. He'll give you two days worth of training in how to live in the desert, and then we're going to send you off into one of these remote Bedouin camps. Now, the good news is that we finished 60% of all the squares in the southern Sinai. The bad news is the remaining 40% are the toughest to get to. So now we have to put you on camels or four-wheel drive trucks, drive you to really remote locations, and then you're going to be set up in those bedroom camps, rotating between those different projects. And then, uh, because this is fairly full as well, uh, you can only do a week of that, and then you can go down to the Red Sea, and you can learn to dive if you want to, or you can learn how to uh, the Red Sea Reef Ecology, which is two lectures every day and two dives every day. This is quite nice because now you're in a hotel. So after you've been living in a remote body with a bedroom camp, then for your second week you've got air conditioning and beds and hot showers. Are you all American? Have we got any non-Americans here? You're all American. Okay, right. Well, are you non-American? Kind of non-American. <laughs> you've got you on that side here. Okay. The only reason I, I ask that, because I keep coming across non-Americans in these um, lectures. Well, unfortunately, this one's Cuba, you're bound. If you're Americans, you're bound from going here. Not, not by the Cubans or by us, but by your own state bound. Uh, so unfortunately, you can't do this one. You could, but the others can't. Um, what nationality do you hold? Peruvian. Peruvian, yeah, you're fine then for that. Okay, this is helping the University of Havana Marine Research Team. And the reason I left the slides in it's not just to find John Americans in the audience, but because it's a good illustration of how we do some of these surveys on remote reefs. The device you can see there is called a stereo video, and it was developed by the Australians at the University of Western Australia, and it's, it's a way of quantifying reef fish communities. Because the way that you used to be able to do this in the past was a technique called an underwater visual census survey, UVC. And the way that works is you get on your wetsuit, you dive down to say 12 meters, you put a tape along the contour, 12 meter contour for example, 50 meter tape, you wait for five minutes when you've done that, and then you're going to swim back along it, you're going to count all the fish that you see below you, all in a box either side of you, one and a half meters, and it's sort of cube going forward. So what I would like you to do please is to, is to just try this if this bit of video works. I'll let you pretend please, you've got slates now, you're in your wetsuit, you're underwater, can you please swim along and identify every fish for me? You have to make sure they come in the one and a half meter box at some point, and you have to estimate the length. That is the standard technique, would you believe, that's used around the world to quantify fish on reefs, and it has obviously one or two drawbacks, as you can see. A much more effective way is to do, use this technique, which is the stereo video. You simply swim along, you caught the fish. You don't do any analysis underwater, it's all done back in the laboratory, so that's the left screen, that's the right screen. So the strange colours on here, but you can see it better normally. Uh, and then you can, you can stop it at any point, and you can identify the fish, and you can put them into Excel or into an access database just beneath there. And the great advantage is that we can check those identifications. And if someone 
says, you know, five years ago, I don't believe you saw all those fish. We simply go back to the, to the digital data and check, because we have that information. So it removes observer bias. But the really neat thing about it is because the cameras are stereo, the software can calculate the distance from the cameras to the fish. So if it doesn't come inside the one and a half meter box, you don't count it. If it does come inside, you click on the, the back of the fish and the front of the fish on the left screen, say there, and then you do the same on its mirror image, and it calculates the length to plus or minus five percent. Now, if I gave you some wooden fish, we all went into a swimming pool, and I said, okay, estimate the length of these wooden fish for me, I guarantee you couldn't get closer than 50 percent. Guarantee you couldn't. And that's with some experience. So imagine all the data that you're reading about now in these papers about coral reefs around the world is based on someone swimming along and counting fish. They may well have missed a lot of them, they may have misidentified some, and they've certainly been wildly imprecise over the lengths. Because in order to get the weight of fish on a reef, the way you do is you have all the lengths and cubits. That basically gives you the weight. If your lengths are already plus or minus 50%, you probably missed some. So this is a much more accurate way of doing it. And we're using this technique across the whole of the Southern Island of Youth in, the, uh, in Cuba. It's the only machine of its type operating in Cuba. But we've set this up also in Honduras, in, in Indonesia, and in Madagascar. If only anybody wants a sort of deep forest experience, then head for Guyana. Do you know where Guyana is? It's in northeast uh, South America. So if you can picture Venezuela, then below that is Guyana. Below that is Suriname, which is the sort of Dutch version of it, and then there's a place called French Guyana, but we're British, so we don't talk about that one. <laughs> so the British Guyana is very good, and it, it's, got a, it's got a huge area of forest uh, called the Iwakama Reserve. It's a setup for conservation uh, research. The principle behind it is that uh, the government of Guyana thinks, well, we've got all these fantastic forests, we want to make some money from them, but we want to maintain the biodiversity as well. So what they're trying to do is look to see whether they can just use selective logging. That's where they go in and they don't clear about an area. They just go in and cut down a few first class of trees. They plant them on site and then they carry it out as, as, as causing the least disturbance as they can. And how does that then affect biodiversity? It creates a lot of income for local communities, but can you do it without affecting biodiversity? Well, what you're doing is you're going to sites there with a, with a big research team that have just been selectively logged. Ones that have been selectively logged a year ago, two years ago, but those which are never going to be selectively logged. You're doing a comparison to see what effect this has. Now, if you want to see the big cats, you know, jaguars, species like this, this is the place to go. Um, this picture was taken by our camp manager, and it started off about 100 meters away from him, came towards him until he got to within 30 meters, and he took out his camera and photographed it. And I don't know, of you, but if I had a Jaguar coming at me from 100 metres through the forest, I don't think I'd take my camera out, but he did, he got some fantastic shots of it, but you're going to see this sort of thing if you're in that forest, but you're living in hammocks, you've got what are called black cat trench toilets, and you are, you've got bucket showers in the middle of the forest. It's a fantastic experience, but it's a tough one. When you spend three weeks working on that, and then your last week, you do a week going down the Burra Burra River on these boats. And uh, this is a really remote trip. Um, so you're going to be camping next to the river. Uh, you have to carry your boat around all sorts of waterfalls and rapids. And what you're doing is accounts of the giant river otters that went through many, the water birds. And also, as you're going along, you're going to see things like arapaima. I don't know if you know what an arapaima is, but it, it's a monster freshwater fish. So some of them are about two thirds the length of this, this table. And they are obligate air breathers. So every 15 to 20 minutes, they'll come up to the surface, they'll grab a load of air, and they'll go down. So you're going down the river on this little canoe, and suddenly you see what looks like a huge grey torpedo coming for you. It's not going to do any damage, it's just going to come to the surface, grab some air, and go back down again. But that is the ultimate remote wilderness experience. This is another really remote one, another good chance of seeing jaguars, humans, ocelots, targets, jaguarundi, all the sorts of things that are the top species in the neotropics. And it's in Mexico. Now, if someone said to me, I'm going to do an expedition to Mexico, I wouldn't be that excited because my mental image of Mexico is Cancun. And I can't think of anywhere less likely to do an expedition to Cancun. But if you go inland, then you have these massive forests. And those forests run right down the peninsula from the, the Yucatan Peninsula over into Guatemala, and then they continue almost unabated right through to Nicaragua. 
and, and right down, in fact, to Panama. But there are breaks in them. And a lot of the conservation organizations now are trying to, to form a thing called the Mesoamerican Forest Corridor, which joins up these big patches of forests. That's another story. Back at the top end here, we've been asked by the Mexican government to go in and see if we can quantify some of the biodiversity of this area. And I'm going to break off for a moment and just talk to you a little bit about the scheme called RED, which is the reduction in emissions of greenhouse gases from deforestation in developing countries. Has anyone, does anyone know about it already? So for those of you who are working in ecology or looking to be field ecologist, you must know about this. It's crucial because chances are you're going to be fit to do your field work using this sort of technique. That also applies to the Green Biology Program. It was set up by the United Nations, and it was agreed at Copenhagen. The concept behind it is that between 17 and 20% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are coming from deforestation in developing countries. So if you can stop that by us giving money, for example, to forestry departments in different countries to stop the deforestation, then we can count those carbon credits saved towards our national carbon budgets. And it's a massive scheme. Four and a half billion dollars. Billion has been pledged already by countries like yours, like ours, and it's country to country. So Germany's given $50 million already to Brazil, the Guyanese have, uh, have got a lot of money from Norway, etc. And it's a great scheme in many ways because it stopped, for example, in Indonesia, the second largest down the top of the rainforest in the world, it stopped deforestation at a stroke. Because the Indonesian Forestry Department thought we were all going to get fantastically rich with all this money that was going to come through from red. So if they could stop forestry, they've got a chance of getting that money, stopping forestry. And therein lies the problem. Because what happens if you give a billion dollars to some of these developing country forestry departments is that not all the money is going to reach the forest wall. Some of it is going to be scammed off into BMWs and Mercedes and so forth. And so it's, it's suffered a lot of criticism that whilst it works at a country level, which is fantastic, you don't save one forest and get all the rest destroyed, it is nonetheless subject to corruption. And so what happened was a lot of big NGOs like the Nature Conservancy, TNC, TNC, Conservation International, WWF, World Conservation Society, they got together and they formed a set of guidelines that are called uh, Climate, Community and Biodiversity Assessment Standards, CCBA. And it's a, basically a document that shows you how to package a forest and at the end of it you get voluntary carbon credits, you get biodiversity information, and you get information on how the money's going to be spent in, in, in terms of poverty alleviation. And you can do that. And we're doing that for, for our Mexican site. We're packaging the whole forest using the information we've collected and then uh, sending that to corporate donors because corporate donors are then looking to put money into red. And that's fine for us, WF and TNC, but it costs a lot of money to do that. And so what we've been doing is funding a postdoc at Oxford to come up with a uh, portal, it's part of biodiversity units in the audience department in Oxford. And what they've done is they've, they've set up, they've got massive database, a huge cellars full of this data, which collect all the satellite data from around the world, uh, and also massive GBIF databases on threatened species distributions. So you can now already put in a shape file into this left document it's called, and it will produce for you automatically a report that shows you the type of forest you've got, the changes that have happened over the last 10 years, the level of fragmentation, the number of threatened species that you have in that piece of forest. In other words, you've removed the cost of doing it. It's now suddenly become free for you as a, a, as a NGO or a small community to package your forest ready for, don ready for red donations. Uh, and once you've done that, of course, you can then create an eBay system. So instead of having a government-to-government -to -government top-down strategy, you can have a bottom-up strategy that can move really quickly. So apologies for spending so long on that, but you do need to know about RED because the chances are when you get employed, that's the funding you're going to be using to actually go out and do this field work. So we put you through a neotropical forest ecology course first, and then after that you're going to be working on all these different types of projects. If you're interested in primates, then definitely go here uh, because for two reasons. One is that the woman that runs this is a spider monkey nut. Completely crazy on the things, uh, and is you know, a very excitable uh, primatologist. But secondly, if you want to see spider monkeys, then they're very difficult things to see normally because they're hunted throughout the whole of the neotropics. But here they're not because the Mayan people believe that spider monkeys were originally uh, God's first attempt at making man. 
and he liked it, and he said, okay, well, that's okay, I'll let that go, and then he had another crack and made us. And because of that, the Mayans protect them, so they've not been hunted throughout, uh, throughout the Mayan range. And of course, these, this is the old, uh, you saw at the beginning, those Mayan temples there, which are just being excavated. That's where you're going to be staying, next to one of those. And you can climb up into the canopy on those temples if you wish to, so you can get really close to the side of these ones. And if you go to this site, you spend three weeks in the forest, and then you go out to the green side, and we put you through a dive training course to paddle up water, or if you already know how to dive and don't want to, we put you through a Caribbean reef ecology course. This is the site where you're going to be diving with turtles, because there are literally hundreds of turtles feeding on the seagrass beds in front and also the lagoons behind. Now, the, the research at this site is to, is to do with water quality. I don't know if you know, if you've been to the Yucatan, but it's built on basically limestone. And the problem with limestone is it dissolves. So rivers will suddenly disappear under water, flow along a while, and then pop up again because they've, they've dissolved those roots. And every so often, if you imagine an underground river, every so often the roof drops in. So if you're flying over the Yucatan, you see all these like, look like a pockmarked cheese. And these are cenotes, or basically uh, areas where the underground river roofs have fallen in. Now the problem in the Yucatan is that tourism is growing enormously. All those guys in Cancun were for the spring break, they now wanting to put more and more tourists in the Yucatan. So they're not looking at putting in water treatment plants. And so what's happening is the concept is that you build a hotel and you put the sewage down one of these cenotes, as they're called, and hope it'll disappear. Well, of course it doesn't. It, it then goes straight out onto the reef. So that's what we're doing. We've got a long-term monitoring program set up on that reef, and it's with Edinburgh University Ge Geosciences Department. If you want to go to the Amazon but live in reasonable comfort, then go on a ship like this. We have four research boats at the top end of the Amazon. Uh, we teach you Amazonian wildlife course in your first week to get you used to what's there. And then you'll be working on a whole range of projects like the, the uh, transects for the dolphins, the pink and grey river dolphins. We've got camera trapping. We've got touch occupancy analysis for the large mammal transects. We've got uh, leash separation in caves, a whole range. Basically, you rotate between all of those different projects. Who's been to South Africa? Anyone been to South Africa? No? Okay, well if you were to go to South Africa, one thing you would notice is that their national parks are very different to your national parks, aren't they? And that they're fenced. And this is three metre high fencing, that's pretty, you know, the height of that screen. And it's triple fencing, electric fencing on the inside, and the idea is that the animals are on the inside and the people are on the outside. And these are vast areas. I mean, the Kruger Park on its own is bigger than the whole of Rhode Island. And it's triple fenced all the way around. And that's just about a quarter of the total area that's under protection in, in South Africa. And that has many advantages, of course, because it protects the animals. But the disadvantage is, what happens about species like elephants, which are no longer now being hunted, and so their populations are growing and growing and growing. And they've now got a finite area. But well, when you see elephants feed, you'll notice um, that they make quite a mess. They literally will pull up bushes, they'll pull up trees, and after they've been through an area, you can tell they've been there. And so they, they, if you allow them to increase in numbers too much, they can simply destroy the habitat. And so the moves have started to try and reduce populations. They don't want to hunt them. They can't catch them and give them away any longer because everyone's got the same problem. So what they're using is contraception. The way they're doing it for most of the reserves is by flying helicopters and then firing a compound called PZP, which is an immunosuppressant, into the backs of as many elephants as they can. And that stops them breeding for a couple of years. But if you imagine in Kruger alone, there are 30,000 elephants, there's no way you're going to get every one of those 30,000 elephants. But you don't have to, you just have to get enough to try and reduce the overall population growth. But another question that came up is, are we sure that we've got the figures right for carrying capacity, because I really think they haven't. There's one of the reserves that we go to, and the experts have come in and they've said, you can have 34 elephants in this reserve, that's the maximum carrying capacity. Well, that should make you suspicious anyway. It's ridiculously accurate. And in fact, they've got 75 elephants, so they've had 75 elephants for a number of years now. They've had to vasectomize them to stop the breeding. And they're all the elephants in perfectly good condition. Most of the land is in good condition. So it seems to me that a lot of the calculations they're using to say we've got too many elephants are actually based on erroneous information anyway. And so what you're doing is you're going to be going to different reserves. You'll go to one reserve, but the whole team's working lots of different reserves with different levels of elephant 
activity, and you're then going to quantify how much damage elephants are causing in those reserves. Anyone see a problem with that? Excellent, we need gullible students, just like you to come out. Well, there is one or two problems, there are one or two problems, but it's going to be on foot in these areas in order to quantify that damage. And what's the most dangerous animal in Africa? What kills the most people? No, no, they don't. Have, no, they're pretty dangerous, but they don't kill the most people. There's something that kills a lot more than that. Hippos. Hippos. Hippos are the most dangerous animal by a mile. But you're okay. They're in the water in the day. You're not going to be out at night. But if you're out at night and you happen to come across them, you don't stand between them and water. Which always seems to be a really stupid you know, set of instructions. Because you're three kilometers out, then you go three kilometers away from water. You're out in the middle of a savannah, it's dark. Do you know which way the water is? I don't know what to look. So you wouldn't, you're never allowed out to, uh, after dark. But uh, hippos will just bite you in two. I mean, literally, they, the, the teeth are like this, a huge thing, massive, just bite you in two. So hippos are fine, they're going to be in the water, so you don't have to worry about them. So what's, during the day, is dangerous, that we're really worried about the wrong foot. What else? Lions. lions. No? Who said lions? lions. No? Um, actually, lions are quite scared of you during the day. I mean, it's difficult to believe that they can get up and roll like that. You want to push them two meters away, but they are. Uh, and if you come across a lion, and this, the procedure is you, you, you train in all this before you even start. You pull behind the gun, because you're going to have an arm guard with you at all times, slowly. You don't run. Under any circumstances, you don't run. You pull back slowly, and you make a huge amount of noise, and the lion will move on. They're not what we're worried about. There's something far more dangerous than lions. Okay, I'll tell you, it's buffalo. You don't think buffalo are dangerous? They don't look dangerous, they look like big cows. But they are phenomenally dangerous because they're so unpredictable. And once they charge, there's nothing you can do about that. 